is a joint meeting between House uh, Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare. Senate Health and Welfare has already been meeting, so this is a continuation for us. But one of the, and as you know, we will be meeting together again tomorrow. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to look at the times at it's 10, 10, 30 10, tomorrow. 10 30 tomorrow and then again on Thursday we'll be meeting together beginning at 9 30 and going through uh, some fiscal issues with Sarah Clark and then listening to North Country Hospital and David Green from Vaz so um, I think this is a this is important for us to continue to work together Bill and I have talked about how to structure uh, some of this and we'll continue to do that. We can't, we're not always gonna be on the same page in terms of what we would like to hear, but um, when we can, it helps us uh, work smoothly together as we did with H742. And I wanna thank the House Committee. While you're all here, uh, the Senate very much appreciates the work that you did in getting that bill to us so that we could work uh, quickly and efficiently on the bill. So this is a, a thank you from uh, our committee to yours. Thank you. All right. And mm -hmm. before I introduce Secretary Smith, um, Representative Lippert, did you want to say anything? Yes, I want to just uh, acknowledge as well that Ginny and I have uh, spent some time talking together and I very much appreciate being able to collaborate. I think it's going to be uh, responsive to the needs of very, very busy witnesses, such as Secretary Smith and others, uh, in this critical time that we, as much as possible, coordinate. Uh, and we have, as the House uh, joined the Senate during the morning period that they have scheduled, uh, and we will continue to do that when we can have a joint meeting. And when we're having separate House Health Care Committee meetings, it will be in the afternoon. And I'll, I'll talk to our committee more about that later. But again, uh, I want to express my appreciation to uh, Senator Lyons for helping us think how to collaborate uh, throughout this week and, and into the future. Terrific. This is great. Um, so Secretary Smith, um, we want, would like to welcome you to our joint committee meeting. Uh, thank you for being here. We know how busy you are. We probably don't know how busy you are. Uh, sure do. I can only imagine. And uh, yes. So our, our initial goal is to hear from you about the uh, implementation of H742. There will be questions. I'm going to suggest to our committees that we hold off for a bit. Let Senator, uh, Senator, I, I didn't want to demote you. <laughs> Secretary Smith, uh, provide information and then um, we'll have to raise our hands and be judicious about uh, the number of questions we have. We'll begin with the chairs and then vice chairs and then go from there. So um, Secretary Smith, I'm simply going to turn it over to you at this point. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. Uh, Mike Smith, Secretary of Human Services. Um, and I thank you um, for, for getting together. Uh, this is a good format in these unprecedented times. And I thank you very much. I'm going to start out talking about the impl implementation of H-742 uh, Act 91. And then, um, if it's okay with the Madam Chair and, and uh, the Chair of House as well, I'll open it up to whatever anybody wants to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm willing to talk about anything uh, that may be on your mind in terms of what's going on, because there's a lot going on. And, and if I can't answer some of your questions, I'm sure Candace will write it down and we'll try to get answers uh, to, to your questions. But in, in general, and, and taking it at a high level, because I know that many of you have uh, had some testimony from uh, people like uh, Corey uh, Gusterson, uh, our commissioner of DIVA, who, who's done a really good job sort of outlining some of the steps that uh, DIVA has taken <clears throat> during this crisis, and they've been quite substantial. So I'll sort of uh, bring it together at a high level. At the same time, Candace is uh, ready to submit a memo that really gets down into the detail of the various things that uh, 
this agency has done. At the outset, let me just tell you, I couldn't be prouder to be uh, secretary of this agency. It is amazing what people have done over the last six weeks with little sleep or um, little rest in terms of what they've been doing and how they've been doing it. I have a 3,600 person agency there approximately. I'm proud of every darn one of them uh, as we move forward. So I'm here to talk and how it's worked to implement the various provisions of Act 91. Let me start by thanking you and the fellow legislators, legislators for taking quick action in a time of crisis to enact legislation to allow us the necessary flexibility to respond to this crisis. As we have talked about, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is unlike anything our state or country has experienced. It has required all of us working together to help our state and neighbors, and we will need to continue to work together to make sure we fully recover um, from uh, this um, unprecedented event, like I said. In the week since we've had our first confirmed case, we have been working to continue our mission of supporting Vermonters as well as to make incredible adjustments to how we do business. We continue to make those adjustments every single day. The legislation that was enacted in quick response to this crisis has both directed and permitted our agency to do the necessary work to respond quickly and thoroughly during this time. I will, like I said, I, Candace will leave you with a memo that includes the response from each department on how they have implemented the different, different provisions of Act 91, and it's been pretty extensive. But here is just a sampling of some of the work captured in the memo. Um, we issued guidance um, to our community providers on how to protect their staff and clients we did rule variances um, along with emergency rules um, when appropriate. Uh, directions and announcements were put out by the health department on how qualified Vermonters can obtain a temporary license during this crisis. Major expansion and continuation in telemedicine, telehealth with a, a variety of providers and services. Uh, in particular, Vermont Medicaid has expanded payments for telephonic services furnished during the emergency response to COVID-19 to specific services, including applied behavioral analysis, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, choices for care, home health, hospice, uh, family supportive housing, and children integ integrated services. There's others, but I, I just highlighted a few. Launched, uh, we launched also a Medicaid re Retainer process for providers um, that are experiencing cash flow challenges during this uh, crisis. To date, um, 13 providers, uh, provider organizations have applied and have been awarded financial assistance through February of April 10. The total dollar amount is about $825,000. As of Monday, April 13, a total of 35 provider organizations have submitted applications. I wanna stop right here and just sort of explain what we're doing. Because if you look at this as a three lane highway, what we're trying to do is make sure that our, our um, healthcare system doesn't collapse. That's, that's basically what we're trying to do. And as we look at it, we have one lane that's providers, FQHCs, other providers that are in that lane and there's a variety of providers that we can look at and those are the providers i was just talking about in the first tranche of financial assistance that we provided and another tranche that we're looking at right now then the next lane is the i like how i use my hands i've never seen that before but um i the next the next tranche is um excuse me the next lane it, are the hospitals and we have some hospitals that are in crisis that we have helped out. Um, Springfield being one of them. Um, we've issued uh, 1.3 million to Springfield. Um, Grace Cottage has requested 725,000 and the, the Brattleboro Retreat 
has requested uh, money as well. And we're still working the specific arrangements out of what that will look like, but it's not going to be a small sum. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, be honest with you on that, but there are other hospitals. I would say those are in the red area. There are other hospitals that are teetering between orange and red as well as this goes on. And uh, there are some hospitals that um, we'll have to look at as we, as we move forward. The next sort of lane that I've been looking at are the DAs and SSAs because they're critically important to our healthcare system as, as we move forward. And, and one of the things that we've done, we've looked at this in phases Again, I got to stop using my hands, but we got to we got to uh, look at this in phases. And phase one, um, with the DAs and the SSAs, we provided monthly perspective case rate payments and provide provided flexibility within the daily rate billing and adjustment to the end of the year reconciliation process to reflect changes in utilization and delivery of services due to COVID nineteen. We also uh, through DMH implemented an emergency case rate for success beyond six. That's the school-based mental health services program to allow continued provision of services and support uh, uh, fiscal stability for DAs. We've also, uh, through DMH as well, provided ex expedited payments for electronic medical record implementation. And that's phase one. Phase two, we, we, we're just starting to put together and that's to look at a request from the DAs and SSAs on a financial relief uh, process, um, mainly because of staffing issues that they're having and some of the issues that they're um, that they're doing along that line. So, um, three lanes, trying to make sure that we keep our um, our uh, healthcare system. Uh, viable during this time and 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 continuing uh, during this time, we're going to need we need the beds. Um, we need our system to come out of this um, uh, in a in, in a way that does that maintains healthcare uh, maintains healthcare in this state uh, in somewhat similar stance as we went in it. Um, there are going to be changes along the way. I mean, um, there there are some always some changes when you have uh, the incidences that we've had in terms of stress along our system. But we are trying to move forward. The other thing for the individual, uh, obviously, you know that we uh, extended the special enrollment. We it extended. We launched a special enrollment period on March twentieth. Um, we currently are discussing, um, we're going to extend that, um, you know, I, I'm, my notes say we're discussing, we're going to uh, extend, we're going to extend that, uh, the, uh, special enrollment period. Um, so one of the questions that keeps coming up and some have asked, um, about this, uh, will the stimulus checks and how they will they impact eligibility for Medicaid? And CMS has indicated to DIVA that stimulus payments will not count for any Medicaid eligibility, but the department is waiting for written guidance to confirm. Uh, we've been told it will be addressed in the next set of FQA, FQ, FAQs to be published. Um, I, I think I want to, at a high level, I want to stop there. The, the, the memo that you're going to get is pretty, um, pretty detailed on the various things that we're doing. But I, I, there, I haven't had the opportunity to sort of sit down and talk with you about the various things that are going on. And there's a lot going on. I just want to take some time and um, not a lot of time but sometime and answer um, some of your questions that you may have. I mean, we've expanded our testing, um, you know, uh, we've, uh, we have looked for, you know, one of the things that we've been doing right lately is looking at those, besides the fact of trying to make sure that our healthcare system doesn't collapse under 
the fiscal stress that, that it's currently under, but also looking at um, what I would say populations that are affected by COVID-19, whether they're healthcare workers that need a place to recover or healthcare workers that are positive and need a place to recover, whether it's disabled, whether it's um, uh, homeless, looking at those special populations. And as you know, yesterday we announced that the Holiday Inn in South Burlington is one of those places. I, I wanna say this too, and, and, and I wanna sort of emphasize this. Um, I wish we had more time to, uh, to move dialogue at a normal pace. I, I wish we, I know Plainfield was a little upset with us in how quickly we were moving. I know um, St. Johnsbury was, uh, was upset at how quickly we were moving, although we did notify the community of the surge site there. Um, the, you know, the normal pace of a dialogue in the placement of facilities, you know, is months, maybe even a year or so. We just don't have that time. And so, you know, conversations that would normally be held over months uh, by necessity, you know, the conversations and action are done in days. And as we look to handle all the populations uh, in a safe and responsible and caring manner, um, we try to do as much as we can to inform people. And, some, and I would say the bulk of the time we get it right, um, we get some things wrong. I mean, in St. Johnsbury, we should have informed the hospital of our transportation plan, which was to move patients in case they got sick in, in our prison population there because we moved them from St. Albans. Those are the tested positive St. Albans to St. Johnsbury where we had set up a surge site that we should inform the local hospital that we had a transportation plan to move them to UVM and not have them feel that they were gonna be overwhelmed with, uh, with patients and that wasn't the case. We, we own that and we are, we are um, you know, we're not perfect in how we're moving forward. But with that said, I, the reason I've launched into this and, and and sort of off topic, because I am so darn proud of Vermonters. I mean, we opened surge sites at Patrick Gym, at the Champlain Valley Fairground, at a hockey rink in Rutland, a surge mental health facility in Essex, and possibly in Springfield, a special population facility, like I said, in South Burlington and others around the state. And Vermonters have rallied. Uh, to their fellow Vermonters. And that's, that is something that is amazing to see. Now, I have been disappointed in a couple of comments that I've seen in, um, in newspapers in particular, and some of the things that have come back to me, like we should put up fences around these temporary sites that we're putting uh, people into, um, uh, uh, you know, a, an isolation and recovery facility or they should wear special uniforms or something like that. We're not doing that. Um, you know, uh, we have a history in this world about doing things like that. We're not going to do that. Um, we will be as safe and re as responsible as possible. We will provide PPE for those people who are caring for these people. We will make sure that we will test where we can along the way as well. But um, we are not going to put a scarlet letter on people who uh, unfortunately could be any of us sit uh, sitting here, you know, broadcasting here. Uh, it could be any of us. So um, we're not going to do that. Um, the, the, but I, I, that, that very, very small minority, I don't want to um, cast because the vast, and cast, you know, aspersions over the vast majority of Vermonters who have been compassionate. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we have done, uh, we met with local officials in St. Johnsbury last night. We met with people in Plainfield. Uh, they have done a pretty good job. In terms of state facilities today, 
We are finishing up um, uh, testing the entire vet's home. Uh, I want you just to be aware of that. We have, um, there was a March 15th case of a staff person who tested positive for COVID-19. That case was, um, that person isolated for 14 days, had two negative nasal swabs after that fact, um, and we had no patients or no other staff test positive. But out of an abundance of care, I ordered that the uh, veterans home be tested uh, over the weekend. And uh, we're in the process of testing 102, 122 veterans there and 200 staff. That should be done today. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I may want to talk about. Um, uh, we have expanded our testing. This is something that um, we did last week, last Friday. Um, we said that we have broadened our approach to testing. Uh, we'll do universal testing for nursing homes, corrections, those homes that house uh, disabled uh, or, or people with disabilities, residential treatment facilities, assisted living facilities, state psychiatric care facilities, when we've detected a case or cases in those facilities. The other thing we've done is uh, to bring you up to speed on, on some of the things we've done just recently, uh, and I want you to be aware of it, is that if you're transferring from a hospital to a nursing home, for example, or to a long-term care facility, you'll be required to test. And as you enter that um, long-term care facility, um, our guidance is you've got to be quarantined for 14 days um, into this. We, we think, and uh, as we go back, um, the areas where we had issues within long-term care facilities were from transfers that were either coming in or, or going out of the, of the facility. Um, we finished testing at um, what is called Decker Towers. Uh, that's in downtown Burlington, um, a fairly large senior living facility. It's not a long-term care, it's not a care facility, it's a senior living facility. Um, and um, the reason why we're testing there is because there had been two recent deaths and we have just discovered through, the, uh, through testing that uh, none of those deaths were COVID-19 related but we did have a person self-report that they had COVID-19 within that facility. We have, um, we have tested um, 139 people in that, um, in that facility. And I think um, I should have the results today on what, what is going on. So I, I, I'm trying to get you up to speed as much as possible. And uh, that's where we are. Thank you, and thank, thanks for bringing up um, the prison issue and also Plainfield. And uh, before we move into questions, I just want to thank Candace Morgan for the work that she did on Plainfield and bringing some of the local uh, senators and reps together on that. That was extremely helpful. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping that the same thing is happening with um, St. Johnsbury so that those folks are reassured. We, we um, Madam Chair, we had a, a corrections met with the select board last night, and it was a very good meeting. So good. that's very helpful. Now, Se Senator Cummings is here, and I think she and I agree that the work that was done with Plainfield uh, smoothed the waters quite a bit. Right. And, and, and by the way, Senator, um, Candace runs the agency, just so you know. I, I got that impression, but I don't know. I don't know. She's a good right-hand person. I know that. She's a very good right-hand person. Uh, so there, I know a lot of questions. You've covered uh, some of the issues I think that uh, people are interested in. Um, I would, uh, I would have questions. Um, I have a lot of questions, and I think that as we go forward on some of the fiscal issues, um, we'll be diving into that in our, in our committee. So I will hold off on some of, the, some of those questions for now, but just knowing that um, the healthcare committee in the house does not, uh, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have oversight over the Department of Health. 
that is is not in your jurisdiction yes or no you're muted you're, on mute. you're muted you're muted that that is correct we we have a bit of a permeable boundary between our healthcare committee and the human services committee or the health yeah human services committee in the house and they primarily have public health jurisdiction in their committee although we sometimes but, are involved but and having having said that the protocols that um, we're asking to have put in place for all of our healthcare workers and people who work within the healthcare environment if they're environmental services workers or whatever uh, those protocols I think are um, important to all of us and absolutely I, I guess one of the questions that I would ask because we've heard so much about it is um, what what are what protocols common protocols are we seeing going to be seen um, distributed out a to to places like grocery stores places like um, res care facilities and are those protocols a are they, have they been developed i know we can find them sometimes on a website but the the frustrating part is having done all the work and knowing everything that has to happen and all the good things department of health is doing and how that gets conveyed out uh into the community um, so just maybe you could help us uh yeah, with that that's a very good question because protocols uh, writing protocols and just putting them up on a website doesn't isn't the the complete answer and through dale through um through DMH, through um, the Department of Health, we've been holding regular meetings with stakeholders on on protocols when they're developed and when they're when they're put out. Not only that, we've also developed rapid response teams to go out and check, especially in our long-term care facilities, go out and check and make sure, A, they have the PPE that they need, and B, that they're adhering to the um, the various uh, standards that they need to do in terms of protecting their their clients from uh, COVID-19. We continue to do that. Um, we've been doing outreach. Uh, we did that over a weekend. We went out to 39 uh, long-term care facilities, plus um, those are nursing homes, plus others as well. I, I don't have the complete number in, in my head in terms of what they did, but we will continue to do that. Um, the commissioners from Monica Hutt to uh, Mark Levine, um, usually in conjunction with Mark Levine at Health, have been reaching out to the various constituencies. That includes Sarah Squirrel, as well as the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. The other thing that we've done is uh, make sure that we stay in communication with hospital CEOs out there and have had regular conversations with them on what we're seeing and what we're doing and what they're doing and having um, and what they need, mostly money from the federal government, by the way, but um, it would be, you know, we are in constant communications with those various, uh, various entities. For example, when I put the visitation policy into place, because that came out of the secretary's office for hospital visitations, um, I was in close contact with the hospital association to make sure that they understood where I was coming from and some of the things that we did. You know, some, one of the, somebody asked me this the other day. They said, what was the hardest decision you had to make here? And, and I, you know, there's a lot of decisions that you have to make. But one of the hardest decisions I think I made was closing access to nursing homes. You know, those, that affects people uh, in an in a awful way because you can't see your relative, uh, uh, you know, in, you can't visit your relative in these, in these times. And, th and that was a pretty difficult um, discussion um, and, and decision at the same time when we had to do that. But it was the right thing to do. Um, we had to make sure that we stopped the spread going into those long-term uh, care facilities because we knew that older people, um, my age group, by the way, is is the vulnerable um, population. Um, I never, I never thought I had to say that. I used to be the youngest person in the room. Now I'm the oldest person in the room. But 
Um, I, um, and, and Dick McCormick, he and I used to have uh, dark hair, but um, the- <laughs> Wait, wait, you're only as old as you think you are. <laughs> okay. Until you're in a pandemic and then yeah. your age gets- Yeah, yeah. I, I've aged about eight years here uh, in the last eight, uh, six weeks. But um, I, you know, these decisions, we tried to convey, we try to have meetings, we have constantly upgraded um, and, and communicated with PPE in particular, making sure that everybody is fully stocked. And, and by the way, our PPE in this state, it, we're in pretty good shape, um, as well as our testing, by the way. We, I, I gotta tell you, through ingenuity, through luck, through hard work, through <laughs> Vermonters being strategically placed throughout the country, um, we've been able to turn a fairly um, limited uh, testing protocol into a very robust testing call. Now, do we have unlimited testing? No, but we have really uh, good and robust. That's why we opened it up to nursing homes and corrections and, and residential treatment and all those others that we opened it up if we found a case. So, Secretary Smith, um... Uh, I don't. I want to make sure that we have some time for others to ask questions. I have a bundle of questions. I'm holding on to them. Uh, I'm going to turn. I, I've got a list of people, and I'll let you know who they are, who have indicated they'd like to ask a question. And this is after Representative Lippert. Um, but I have Brian Smith, uh, Mary Cordes, um, Lucy Rogers, uh, and Sen Senator Ann Cummings. Ann Cummings. So I've got that list, and if um, I'm hoping that these will be um, very clear, concise questions, uh, so that we can get the answers similarly. Yeah, I'm hoping that I'm hoping it's <laughs> that the answers will be the same one. Uh, Representative Lippert, uh, let me very quickly uh, acknowledge the extraordinary work that the agency is doing. Uh, that the Department of Mental Health, we worked very closely with Commissioner Squirrel uh, and Diva and Commissioner Gustafson and his staff. They've been very responsive. I should, I will acknowledge I was, I've been communicating with Commissioner Gustafson about extending the open enrollment period. Off, we've been doing that offline over the past week. And just this morning, he indicated that they're very close to making that formal announcement, which you alluded to as well. I guess and I said, I, and I said I wouldn't announce until he had told me, but I think we're saying it. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge the very, very important role that DFR has been playing, uh, that the Department of Financial Regulation in issuing bulletins has been absolutely critical. And I understand they have several more bulletins that are in the works uh, about uh, insurance. And that, that part uh, is, uh, has been very, very important, as well as the Department of, uh, Department of Health. Um, I think I'd just like to... Uh, so maybe have one question I have, and it has to do with finances. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with, uh, I, I was invited to join the call for the legislators with the Counseling Service of Addison County, one of the DAs. And um, they, they indicated, as I've heard from numbers of other settings where they're having to frankly offer and wanting to offer additional compensation to uh, workers, particularly in residential settings, where it's critical to keep the group homes and residential settings whole, uh, to keep this keep them fully staffed, and the some of the conflict, both by fact of the, the difficult work, and then the conflict that has arisen through the federal uh, unemployment insurance, which is undermining in some ways, uh, or pushing us to frankly compensate workers at a higher level, and uh, what they described as appreciation pay of bumps of in some cases two dollars an hour, et cetera. Uh, I want to I want to ask and uh, know if that type of uh, that type of action on the behalf of whether it's a DA or whether it's another setting uh, is going to be reflected in uh, whole, keeping them financially whole. Before you before you ask that question, I will say that the our the Senate Health and Welfare Committee has spent an extensive amount of time on this issue, and just in trying to understand who it affects and who, is, who would want to quit work and go to UI. So there are a number of folks in Dale uh, and yes. other areas. So um, it, this is a critical issue. 
So yes. Secretary Smith. Uh, yeah, let me answer that question. Um, and it's a very good question and one we're on top of. Like I said, we, we, we've we looked at this in two phases. Phase one, you know, all the perspective uh, case rate, um, the implementation of the emergency case rate and uh, getting money to them in the most expedited manner that they can, including the emergency, uh, the electronic medical records. But phase two, um, which we're working on right now, is, um, and I would think that we would have something fairly soon, um, real soon, by the way, um, that um, addresses the issue that, that you have talked about. Um, the, the staffing issue at the DAs is, is exasperated by just about what you just said. The federal government, a UI sort of um, uh, situation, but is also um, in the early stages by fear. Uh, I, I mean, people didn't want to show up uh, and fearful about what is uh, what is going on. There was a lot of, you know. Uh, a lot of things going on in the in the early stages of this uh, this virus. We aren't over this. I, I don't want, want to meet say that, but there were a lot of things happening there. We're we're trying to get some relief out to them. Uh, I think I'll have more details by the end of the week. Good, thank you. Thank you. I think I'll hold my questions. I again, I have my but there's many of our committee members who would like to chime in. Uh, I, so I've I, got I, a, I'll leave it to you to call on people. I've got a list. I've added. Um, after Cummings, I've added Durfee and Page. So I've got you folks. Uh, so- uh, okay. Senator Lyons. Yes. Said, uh, Representative Lippert asked my question. Okay. So you can take me off for now. All right, we'll take you off for now. And, and um, Senator Cummings, thank you very much for your help uh, with Plainfield as well and getting legislators together. We really appreciate that. Uh, Brian Smith, you have a question. Where's Whistler? Uh, you're muted. You, you, there we go. Thank there you. you go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Smith, for having this meeting today. Uh, I've had a number of calls from people in the area wondering, you know, the whole big motto right now is stay safe and stay home, but you moved uh, over 20, I don't know how many prisons you moved into the Northeast Kingdom that uh, are infected with the coronavirus. And Orleans, Essex, and Caledonia counties are very, very uh, light with infections as compared to some of the other areas in the state. Why would you do that? Well, why would the state do that, I should say? Well, we had surge capacity in that facility, and that's one of the reasons we had capacity in that facility, and we separated out the um, infected into a uh, into a facility where we had capacity. We on in uh, I think it was the last part of March. We informed both the town and um, and legis the appropriate legislative committees that we were going to be using that facility as as surge capacity. But you could also ask the same question. Every town could ask that same question. I mean, the people of Essex could say, why'd you put a, a surge facility in, in Essex? Actually two uh, in, in Essex. The people of South Burlington could ask that same question. Why did you put an isolation center in, in our facility? The people in Rutland could say the same thing. Guys, we're in oh. this all together. And, and I, the fact is, just let me finish, Brian. The okay. fact is, that if you don't think, you know, you could make the same argument about, um, about, you know, people coming out of a healthcare facility, for example, in terms of what's going, going on. Now, we have moved people from St. Albans where we didn't have capacity uh, to, a, uh, to a facility in St. Johnsbury where we did have capacity. And we have put in extraordinary precautions in that facility uh, to make sure, in, 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 including, and I think the town would agree with us on this, including decontamination de of, uh, of people entering and exiting that facility. So um, we've, the PPE is there, the, um, so, uh, you know, I, would, would I rather not done that? Yeah, but it had capacity and we had to do what we had to do. 
there was no the, the, where they were there wasn't the capacity to handle what was going on with them no there, there was we had to isolate them from the people that were negative and that's what we did and so um we had four negative pressure rooms in in uh in st albans we exceeded the capacity of those negative pressure rooms right there it's it's surge capacity. That's what we're talking about in all these facilities. If we exceed the capacity within a certain facility, we can move them. As you know, that's what surge is all about, and that's what we did in this case. Now, did we expect 28 people to be moved all at once? No, we didn't, frankly. But we had the facility ready for it in case they did, and that's and that's what we did. They are completely quarantined. Yeah, the, 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 your prisoners aren't going to get out, I hope. Uh, I mean, they're but, not having family members come and visit them or anything? No, we have stopped visitation long ago uh, okay. with uh, correctional facilities. Um, matter of fact, we had gone to video um, visitation long ago. It was way into March that we had stopped that um, because we didn't want... Um, uh, this to become in, uh, a facility become infected. Unfortunately, St. Albans did, uh, and that's unfortunate. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Secretary. I agree with you. I'm very proud of the work that um, the state has done that Vermonters have done. Um, I see it both as a legislator and as a nurse working at UVM Medical Center. Um, and I'm so grateful to all who are pitching in, including uh, my own union, uh, the, st the re union representing state employees um, and frontline retail workers. Um, it's as someone who's worked extensively in disaster relief, um, this is what needs to happen and I'm, I'm grateful for it. So I, I have um, some questions that um, I will touch on very briefly. And then um, if I may, I will send um, as an email because they go, it goes into more detail um, and I don't wanna take up more time uh, right now. My suggestion is if you have those questions, and if the secretary has time to respond by email, which, you know, uh, perhaps it would be his right hand person, um, that we would get that sent out to both committees. You could send it to Nellie and the response, at least to Nellie and uh, Julie or Demis, uh, probably Demis and Julie and Nellie. Yes. And can that I be helpful? Go ahead. Can I just touch on the issues and then send the email? Sure. That would be terrific. Thank you. Um, the first issue is around EMS providers um, who are having issues with not having um, N95 testing, fit testing capacity. Um, they are spending money that they're uh, not getting reimbursed for yet. And I recognize things are moving quickly. So as I say this um, and share this information from my constituents, I realize that things may have changed. Um, uh, decontaminating ambulances, um, um, federal money, is that gonna be coming to frontline EMS workers? Um, and the last comment is that um, from this local EMS service, the only support that they've gotten is 20 expired N95 masks, old Ebola suits from the last crisis and 10 face, face shields. Um, so I will send an email about <clears throat> in more detail about the EMS um, issues and um, especially since um, it's a little ironic that the um, H742 was the vehicle we used to um, do all this amazing COVID work, but the underlying bill was about making sure that existing funds um, from fire safety assessments get to frontline local volunteer EMS folks um, immediately. And um, I, I'd love an update on, um, and I've, I've been asking, but haven't gotten answers yet on when that money is going to get to them. The last question is about migrant workers. And I realize I'm crossing um, committee boundaries. Um, so I'll just put it out there and put the rest in my 
email, um, there's housing, healthcare. Um, these workers provide us um, with uh, the dairy that we all love in Vermont and other uh, products. Um, so I'm going to jump in here, Mari. Let me jump okay. in and say I was that. Gonna, uh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Say that Senator Lyons and I are in conversation about scheduling testimony about uh, dairy workers and health access to health care. Uh, so it's already on our agenda looking ahead. Thank you so much. Can, yeah. And again, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Um, and uh, your right hand person, uh, Candace, thank you so much. Hey, um, you know, um, let me talk about PPE for, for a minute. We have, um, we have developed through a lot of sources um, a fairly good supply of PPE. And there is a process of uh, requesting uh, PPE uh, for uh, EMS and others that are out there. I would urge them to contact the state EOC uh, to get their uh, PPE if they feel that there's insufficient PPE because um, we have enough to distribute out there. I'm gonna be talking to the hospitals tomorrow because I've heard some uh, issues with frontline hospital workers saying they're not getting the PPE that they need. We've got PPE um, and we've, we, if, if that isn't the case, then it's, I, I need to talk to the hospital CEOs, which I'll do tomorrow to say, where at your facility is it, is there not getting the PPE that, that you need? Because we've got it, you've got it at the hospital level why do the front line, if there are people out there that don't feel that they're getting it, either they haven't been informed of the right PPE they should be getting, or number two, um, they're not getting it for a specific reason. We need to communicate that uh, out there in terms of what is going on and how it's going on. I, I, I wanna say we have PPE and we're monitoring burn rates, we're monitoring everything. We're in pretty good shape as a state with PPE, as, as, as I mentioned, as well as testing as a state. Okay, so Secretary Smith, thank you. And I think that is one of my overarching questions. I'm not going to ask it right now, uh, but it was the reason that we invited you in to talk about uh, the implementation of H742, and that is the overarching concern, the more of a question about uh, communications and how that information gets out to boots on the ground. And I think, so that this is very helpful, um, but it's important. And I know in the Senate, the Senate GovOps is working on funding for our EMS folks. We also in our committee have passed out uh, an EMS uh, bill as well. So some someday they'll be over to you folks. Uh, and, can, I, yeah. can I jump in and say yesterday I spoke with, uh, in response to questions around ambulance reimbursement, I spoke with DFR. They, yeah. are, issue, they are issuing a bulletin. Uh, they, have been, they have already been enforcing this. I'm not sure where the miscommunication happened uh, somewhere between constituents in the Senate, but uh, DFR is going to be issuing a bulletin uh, that they already had in draft form so that the ambulance associations will be getting direct reimbursement as is required by Vermont statute. So that has been resolved. Th thanks, Bill. I, I, I do want to say, you know, um, I, I want to give kudos to DFR. I mean, they really, you are absolutely right. And I'll extend my time, Madam Chair, because I'm kind of hogging it here for everybody. But um, the they have done an amazing job. Not only have they done an amazing job in what you're talking about with directives, they've done an amazing job with modeling. Um, and that is extremely important as we were talking about surge and getting ready for surge, the modeling that they have done. And the, as the model, modeling has shown, we're doing pretty good uh, in, in comparison to the earlier models, which scared the living uh, heck out of me um, as we, as we, uh, as we entered this thing. So it, 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 the actual sort of predictive modeling is, uh, is something that's essential for us as we uh, move forward. Thank you for that. The modeling has been great. Uh, Representative Rogers, you're up next. And I do have uh, Representative Chena, you are on the list. 
Thank you, Secretary Smith, and thank you so much for spending your time this morning with us. Um, I have a quick series of questions relating to the, the cash flow assistance for Medicaid enrolled providers. Um, if, I, I think what I heard you say before was that you've had 35 providers submit applications and have already distributed $825,000. Um, I'm curious if you could give me a sense of what is, is this the type of situation where any applicant that, that qualifies will be receiving money? Is there a high amount of competition amongst the applicants? You know, what out of those 35 applicants you've had so far, has it been a high percentage that's been um, accepted? Yeah, let me just get the numbers. 13 provider organizations have applied and, and been awarded uh, another 35 are waiting and submitted oh, applications. So we've already we've already sent out about $829,000, I think is the, uh, the closest figure that I get. It's about $829,000, if I remember. Um, the, uh, we have, a fair, we aren't giving it to everybody and in the amounts that they've asked for. Um, we have a, sort of process that we've gone through in terms of what money that they have available, what money they may be getting in, in Medicaid reimbursement, all there's a whole formula that, that we've been using in, in these times. So um, will everybody get everything that they ask for? The answer is no. Will they get some? I don't know if we've rejected any um, we may in the future, but I, I don't know if we've rejected any yet. Okay, that's helpful. And then is there a, to is there a cap on the amount of money that's available um, in this fund or, or is it kind of on a rolling basis depending on that? It, it, it's sort of on a rolling basis right now. I mean, we're not unlimited, um, but at the same time, you know, we're hoping to recoup some of this money through future Medicaid uh, payments uh, that, you know, once, stability gets back in the system to recoup it in future Medicaid payments, as well with the hospitals as well. Um, if they get payments from the federal government or uh, through future uh, Medicaid payments, um, some of that money, I, I won't tell you that's, that it's not at risk, it's at risk, uh, but some of that money hopefully will get paid back. And this is I'm sorry, go, sorry, go. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, I'll ask. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, go ahead. Is, is there a kind of normal amount of wait time a applicant should expect between submitting their application and either receiving money or being notified yeah. of the decision? Um, Representative Rogers, I don't have a, a specific time period we've been trying to turn these around as quick as possible um with 13 already already paid it sounds like that's been the case yeah already. it's been real it's been real fast um uh so it does have to go through a process and i, I you know i still want to make sure that it does go through a process but um the turnaround time has been real quick great and then my last question is um just to clarify it's my impression, but just to clarify that the intention is that this money would be available for independent practices as well as FQHC. Yes, yes, yes. And is there it, it, any... there, there, it, It's a wide variety of, uh, of providers that we would put and this And is on. there a priority ranking based on type of provider or not so much? Not, not right now. It would be on the need that's out there in the community, I think. Thank you so much. Those are my questions. These are all prospective payments. Um, there are payments that we hope that when stability comes back in, maybe we can recoup some of this money. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say we'll get all of it back. Got it. Okay. Um, so, Representative Durfee, you're up next. Representative Chena, I think, has been waiting. I've got him on the list. He's after Representative Page. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, ju just a couple things. Uh, we had a conversation with the uh, with Tom D and the folks at the hospital down here in Bennington last week, and there was some conversation about PPE. Uh, it followed an article that ran in the in the local paper that morning or the previous day, asking community members to supply to help 
contribute uh, masks and skull caps, possibly gloves too. So I might just want to clarify with him what the status of, of their need is. Yeah, I, I, I will because we, uh, we can turn around PPE very shortly on deliveries. So okay. uh, I, I will clarify on that. Okay, good, thank you. Um, uh, quick, quick question. Um, when, how, how long do we think the uh, open enrollment period will be extended? I, I don't have an answer for you right now. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, it, it may, go ahead, Bill. May 15th. May 15th. Thank you. There okay. you go. That, that's tentative, not final, but that's what. Okay, yeah. great. But since we've opened it up, I'm going to talk about it. Asked you, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I approved opening it up. I didn't approve uh, how, what the date is. So I, we'll make it we'll make it the 15th of next month. So there you go. That works for me. And, and then uh, Secretary Smith, you, you mentioned um, transfers in and out of the long term care facilities as being potentially the source of, uh, of problems that we've had. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Not really. I'm just I'm sort of speculating uh, at this point. That's why we've put in place um, uh, these extra sort of guidelines that we're talking about long-term care facilities. A, if you're transferring into a long-term care facility, you have to be tested before. Now, you've got you to understand the limitations of tests. You can do, test one day and be negative and test the next day and be positive. So, you know, we got to understand that. But also putting the quarantine aspect of it into uh, place as well. Uh, so, you know, those are the, the two things that we're doing uh, in, in order to make absolutely sure that we're not spreading it from uh, one facility into another. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, Representative Page and then Representative Chena, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I was glad that you mentioned uh, some work that you're doing at the Bennington Soldiers Home based on what's going on in just uh, south of us in Massachusetts and Holyoke area. Um, a couple questions. The Newport Prison, if, um, if prisoners uh, be test positive there, will they also be moved to St. Johnsbury or is there an area there at Newport in which you can isolate them? And then finally, um, it seems in the past, uh, you know, states have looked to the feds for assistance in various crises and, um, and they've led, led the way, the feds have led the way generally. Now there seems to be a trend where states tend to lead the way in, in being proactive. And I'm just curious, are there policies in which we could be proactive on Re in relation to you know our hospitals, say like my own here at Newport or or the Northeastern uh, Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury, and I'll I'll listen for your response, sir. Thank you. Well, you gave me a wide lane there. Um, we <laughs> have. Um, I'm pretty proud of this state and 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 the governor and all of you of how we've reacted to this crisis. Um, we're in. And I don't want to claim victory, so don't misunderstand me, but we're in pretty darn good shape compared to a lot of other states uh, that are uh, surrounding us right now. Um, primarily because we acted early and we acted on our own. We expanded testing when the CDC wasn't, wasn't recommending it. They were recommending only testing for people that were hospitalized. We said no. We said we we're going to test for people that had symptoms, and we and, and frankly, we came very close to running out of test supplies at one point uh, because we had that policy in place. When we needed more data, we tested more. We didn't stop testing. We tested more when we needed more data to make sure that we were on the right course in in moving forward. Um, we went out and got our own supplies. Uh, we went out and and found test and found testing capability. We ran an airplane from Burlington to Rochester, Minnesota to the Mayo Institute to get our tests on a daily basis. We did a lot by ourselves. Um, and, and the fact is we've expanded testing 
uh, to the facilities that, that, I, that I talked about. In terms of Newport, if we strip out of our capacity out of Newport, like we did in St. Albans, there's a chance that we would move um, uh, COVID positive patients if we had the space in uh, St. Johnsbury as well. Um, like I said, if we, if we get a case or cases in, like we did in St. Albans um, in a facility, we'll test the whole facility uh, like we did. This is not a, a small undertaking, by the way, as well, as well as the veterans home. I mean, you know, these facilities are good size and we test within 28 to 48 hours. We have a lot of people on the ground that are testing. So I, you know, I, I'm holding my tongue a little bit on the federal response um, because um, we've done a lot by ourselves and, and, and you all should be proud of what, uh, what you've all done here, all pretty much by ourselves as we, uh, as we move forward. We've done by ourselves together. Uh, we, right. it, you know, uh, I must say it's really critically important to keep lines of communication open between administration and legislature. That's right. Uh, yeah. I, when, when, I, when I met by ourselves, I met all of us. I understand. <laughs> I completely understand. Uh, Representative Chena, it's your, it's your turn. Thanks, Senator. Um, so I have three questions I'm gonna ask. Um, and then secretary, if, if, um, if you need to follow up later with answers, that's fine, but I'll put them out there now. Um, one question question has to do, uh, you mentioned um, the different lanes, I'm um, even doing your hand motions, you know, the <laughs> different lanes, you know, um, and, uh, and one of them was the designated agencies and specialized service agencies. And in the last uh, few years, the state has stepped up and tried to improve funding for designated agencies um, for the hard work we asked them to do, but we didn't do the same um, for the specialized service agencies. And so what we're hearing, I'm hearing from constituents and colleagues that um, they're having a hard, uh, even harder time keeping staff and recruiting staff now that there's more hazardous working conditions. And so one question would be, what can we do to improve funding for those agencies so that they not only can pay workers what they deserve equal to the designated agencies in the state, but also what kind of hazard pay or hazard benefits could they get? Um, the second question um, has to do with, um, with how we're... Um, helping homeless people during the crisis. I know that in Burlington, there's a camp that's being used for people. Um, and then also the hotel that you mentioned for COVID positive people who are experiencing homelessness. But my concern is what are we gonna do when the pandemic subsides um, about the people who are being housed in these temporary facilities? And this ties into the specialized service agency issue of um, what might we do after so that we can end homelessness now that so many people are engaged in services um, to, to be safe during the crisis. And the last question is, um, has to do with what's next. Um, I'm also grateful for all the hard work that the state agencies have done to prepare for a surge. And, and it does seem like we're well, we're well positioned for a surge, but if we can prevent that surge um, in order to maintain public health we're going to need a long-term strategy, and um, we've been hearing a lot about what what's working and not working around the world in terms of following up this phase with contact tracing and more testing and antibody testing. And I've heard you and, and others speak in press conferences. I'm I'm one of the regular followers of your press conferences, um, so, so I've heard some of this before. But I'm wondering if you could speak a little more about what are you what are your thoughts about the long-term plan, like not just the next three months, but like the next 12 to 18 months, in terms of how the state can um, manage the, and control the spread of, of uh, COVID-19. And also I'm curious if there's any talk about coordinating with surrounding states, like there's a pact uh, of states in the Northeast um, trying to coordinate their efforts about reopening. And that seems like a wise strategy. Um, so I'm just curious about that as well. Thank you. Let's um, let me try to um, answer those one at a time. Um, when I talk DAs, I talk SSAs as well. I mean, we are looking at how we're funding uh, both entities, recognizing that they're both important and they have unique roles that we we do have to uh, recognize uh, during this crisis. On homelessness, I, I, I got to tell you, we spent we've spent enormous amounts of time to make sure uh, that 
people are not going without a home uh, in, in, at night. With COVID positive, obviously we have facilities. We talked about the Holiday Inn. For COVID negative, we have the, the North uh, Letty Beach um, in terms of what's there, but we also have um, you know, opened up a, uh, another hotel in, uh, in Chittenden County for uh, homeless that are not COVID positive. And our, um, our hotel voucher uh, system has been robust, uh, to say the least, uh, as we move forward. As we, um, as we talk about the, the sort of the next phase in this, and the various testing that will be done. We've, we've formed a task force in terms of the various testing that can be done. Um, and there are various ways uh, to test um, that are different in terms of looking at the future and those with antibodies within their system and things like that. I, I gotta tell you, I've never known how much I use my hands, but um, the antibodies that are you know, out there, but that's not for right now. Um, but looking at the future in terms of contact tracing, we never gave up on contact tracing. Actually, we bolstered our contact tracing during this crisis because we never gave up on confinement um, and confining this. You know, mitigation was all the things that the governor put in place. Uh, you know, the, the uh, shutting down in the school system, the stay home, stay safe those sort of things are mitigation, but we never gave up on confinement. And, and you're starting to see that now with sort of our expansion with nursing homes and corrections and uh, designated uh, uh, residential treatment facilities in terms of what's going on. As we get ready to even think about um, restarting, and I think that's the word that I would use, restarting our economy, it's not gonna be flip a switch on as the governor has talked about. It's gonna be a turn here as, we, as we, we, we start doing it. And you know, if we can learn from those other um, states that are doing it, um, that's, that's fine. I, I, I don't mind, you know, and I, I'm sure the governor doesn't mind collaborating, but we've been doing a pretty darn good job with what we're doing and we should continue to do what we think is best for this state and how we can move forward on our restart. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're again, A, SSAs we're looking out for, homeless, we're, we're, um, we've got to put a program in place. Um, and we started to put the elements of those in place before this hit in terms of a long-term strategy for homelessness. And then um, third, We've got to move to other strategies, and I'm hoping that there's either a, a, a vaccine or a, um, I'm hoping for a vaccine and a test that will help us in those long-term strategies. Thank you. Uh, right, I, I guess one of my questions in terms of the second wave and the long-term strategy, I keep, continue to come back to the need for a therapeutic treatment or uh, vaccination. We know that the vaccination is probably 12 to 18 months away, regardless of what anyone is saying. We also know that there are some really excellent clinical trials going on, including in this state on some therapies, and I'm hoping that some of those will pan out. But as we look at turning things back on, I would, I, I guess the question is, will the state to continue to allow those uh, workers who are among the vulnerable population populations. Will the state allow for those workers to continue to work remotely until we have some vac vaccine or some proven uh, therapies? Yeah, I think if the, you know, there's a lot of vulnerable people in, in, in that group. I mean, um, there are people that, for example, that are on um, cancer drugs. Uh, that are vulnerable. There are other people. It, they're going to. We're going. They're going to continue to work remotely until we can uh, figure out what is the final. What is the solution here? Because we are going to have a rebound I, unless we have a vaccine. We're going to have a. We're we're going to have a rebound at some point in in the future. 
uh, whether it's next flu season or, you know, this acts like a flu is just more contagious and, and, and in some regards deadlier. Um, so we're going to have to uh, figure this out as we go forward. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that is actually reassuring to a number of people who have contacted me with that question. It's very helpful. Um, so any other questions? For Secretary Smith, could I just name a couple quick things and whether we sure. hear responses now, and then one comment that I, I want to make sure uh, I share. Uh, one is to just for the committee and for the Secretary to know that uh, we are meeting tomorrow as again as a joint committee uh, with representatives from the Department of Health around uh, racial justice and equity issues, and that uh, the collection of race data which apparently wasn't happening early on, uh, really does need to happen. And we'll be talking about that in some testimony tomorrow. I'm not sure. Uh, and a, a question that's been raised in our committee a number of times is directives and help for those dealing with uh, remains uh, for, for uh, folks who have tested positive and how to have uh, workers stay safe as we have the unfortunate circumstance which we have of people passing on uh, from COVID-19 and how to stay safe throughout the entire process of removal of uh, bodies. Uh, I, and I was, it was shared with me, there is a protocol that I think Dale has issued, uh, which I have not yet had a chance to share with our full committee or perhaps with both of our committees. Uh, but I think there's still some remaining questions there. Uh, again, I don't think we need to address it right now, but I think it is an issue that people are asking about and, and I don't think there's particular awareness of. Right. And then, uh, the, the last thing, the last thing, last point I'd like to make before we finish is to acknowledge uh, the significance of our payment reform efforts and how that has in fact been incredibly positive for sustaining our hospitals as well as uh, our DAs and uh, uh, our uh, folks who are working through payment reform uh, where monies in fact have been able to be put forward on a regular basis uh, rather than on a fee for service, which has just dropped out from underneath us, and I think we need to, we need to be uh, unabashed in uh, acknowledging uh, the uh, important impact that uh, many of these payment reform efforts have made during this type of emergency. So, yeah, I, ch Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I couldn't agree um, uh, more than what you just said. I mean, the payment reform effort has allowed us the flexibility to do many of the things that we're, we're doing right now. In terms of the remains, there has been guidance that has been put out by the medical examiner's office uh, and we'll share those and we'll see what, 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 can, um, what we can do better in terms of going on from there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I want to reinforce what uh, Representative Lippert has said about our payment reform and link that with the ACO and how critically important it is to maintain some cohesion and cohesiveness for that organization going through this um, emergency. Uh, and I encourage all of us on our two committees to be supportive voices for payment reform and for, the, and for the ACO. I know that is sometimes difficult for some people, but it is, it is uh, we are ahead in so many ways of every other state that uh, we need to recognize that and, and thank uh, Secretary Smith for your persistence on this and others for, for the work that they're doing. So um, I think unless um, there are other questions or comments, I, we could all make comments all day. We're not gonna allow that, but if, unless there are other questions. Um, this has been great. Great. Thank you, Secretary Smith. And thank, thank you, you for all the work that you are doing. It is very much appreciated. And I'm seeing the person on your left. We, uh, we appreciate the work that your office is doing um, very much, so. Thank you very much. I appreciate all Thank of what you. you're doing as well. So good. We'll, we'll we got to keep soon. it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, committees. Uh, I think that is it for the day. I know that a couple of the senators had to leave for another meeting. Uh, we okay. will be meeting again um, 
tomorrow. Tomorrow yes. at 1030. Yes. And again, I want to say, uh, Senator Lyons, I think our work to do this jointly has proven to be very valuable and uh, Good. efficient and effective. So I'm glad we've put the energy into doing that. And thank you to all the committee members who participated in a way that allows uh, everyone to have a chance to participate because doing these doing joint committee meetings between the House and Senate is often a work in progress. And I think we've been successful today. So thank you. Very much so. And we'll be doing our agenda planning tomorrow for next week. So as will we, as will yeah, we. Good. All right. Okay. Thank See you, you all tomorrow. Thank you.